Hello again and welcome to our podcast series Startups of Today for the Impact of Tomorrow. And an amazing episode that we have today for you is around startups and governments. Why do they partner with each other? How can they benefit from any collaboration? What are the things to keep in mind? And as usual, we have two guests to discuss this topic with us. And I'm very happy to announce uh, we have Mohammed Fagiri, who is the CEO and founder of Ukudo. So, Mohammed, welcome. Welcome and thank you. And we have Eve Iradukunda, who is the permanent secretary of Ministry of ICT and Innovation, Government of Rwanda. Welcome, Eve. Thank you for having me. So maybe I'm just going to start immediately by asking, uh, because I was very interested and excited about this uh, uh, topic and this episode. Eve, why do governments want to work with startups? Oh, thank you. And that's a very interesting studying uh, of our episode today. I think, uh, 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 to my knowledge, there is no country uh, that I know uh, that has achieved economic prosperity without entrepreneurs, without startups and innovators and uh, MSMEs, companies that um, are focused on innovating and solving problems and uh, as, a, as a result, you know, creating jobs and wealth for, for its people. So I think for any government, it's imperative that um, uh, startups and innovators are given the space to be able to drive uh, that economic growth uh, from that perspective. And so if you're a government that is looking at creating wealth for the people and uh, uh, achieving prosperity, uh, if you're looking at uh, being innovative um, in, in, in how you solve your challenges, uh, whether it would be healthcare, education, uh, food security, and many other aspects, uh, especially you know in this uh, technology-driven world where a lot of is on technology, you really want to uh, create a space for the startups. Uh, but I also, as I mentioned, job creation. I think uh, for a country like Rwanda in particular, where we have a very young population, the very young private sector, um, startups do play a critical role in our uh, socioeconomic growth. So job creation is very important. Um, and ultimately, you want to uh, have um, a society that is uh, socially cohesive. And I think uh, startups do play a role um, when when citizens uh, in general feel they're able to contribute. And then by citizen, uh, it's entrepreneurs, small companies that are able to uh, use their means to, to, to also uh, create um, that uh, uh, economic growth and in, in return have a social impact. Thanks for that, Eve. I'm actually going to come uh, back to some of the points you mentioned there, which are really interesting. But before that, I'm actually going to get the startup perspective. So, so Mohammed, like, even more interesting for me than hearing that from the government is from the startups. Why would startups prefer to work with governments? Thanks, Abhijit. I wouldn't say prefer, I would say more w- what 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 are the uh, status or when do actually startups will work and why why will be in a situation or what make us as a startups work with governments? You look at startups and entrepreneurs; they are they are there to change and to uh, and and to make an impact. And sometimes that impact, directly or indirectly, will come will be there will be an involvement or there will be. T- we will be touching some of the government services or to have that change and to have that disruption that you're looking for that there, there will sometimes there is that uh, government uh, impact so depends on the um, on, on the market or depends on the problem that you're trying to solve you will end up in situations where you have to collaborate or you have to uh, address some of the challenges and sometimes these challenges that you're trying to address is beyond the enterprise and you need to either collaborate or have a common uh, in, uh, a common work uh, working at understanding between startups and between governments and and I think what Eve mentioned earlier which is extremely important is how governments as well are open to that collaboration. And I think we're going to cover a lot of these points during the discussion today. 
No, thank you. And and Mohammed, staying with you on that, because it's interesting that, you know, what the two of you have said, that there could be a range of reasons why the two sort of collaborate. But were there any experiences for Okudo, for example, uh, in, in what Okudo wanted to do? And was there, you know, commonality of interest when you found a government that, were, you know, it was beneficial to work with them? Yeah. So our main business in the identity space, so anything to do with onboarding, verification, authentication. And these things, as you can imagine, they are very close to governments and government services. And for you to be able to help the enterprise to have a digital, you cannot have a digital economy. You cannot have the ability to make a true change through technology without the ability of be able to verify and understand who are you dealing with. And this is where you will have to have that interaction with the government for them to understand what are, what are you trying to achieve, how are you trying to solve the problem, which is a common problem. It's a national level challenge. And across across the regions, like we're talking about, whether are talking in, in the smaller region, Middle East and Africa, or even beyond that, we are facing the same challenges. How can we enable the digital economy, especially after COVID, especially after the lockdown, where we end up looking at ways to reboot the economy and enable the uh, and, and 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 enabling different way for people to to uh, to be economically active again. Thanks, and 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 Eve, you mentioned you know a few reasons why sort of governments. Uh, um, would like to work with with startups for certain aims, you know, societal aims that the government has. What has been your experience working in the Rwandan uh, Ministry for ICT? Have there been these relationships and examples that have benefited society? No, absolutely. Um, it happens to be that um, part of our mandate here at the ministry is to promote um, innovation across the board, uh, not just in technology, but also looking at other sectors. Uh, and of course, technology do play a big part in terms of how does it help accelerate uh, the economic sector. And so we've had um, innovations taking place into healthcare uh, system. Uh, one of the most successful example that is known globally is a, a, a company called Zipline that uh, came to Rwanda, set up a use case for uh, drone uh, delivering blood to remote uh, health care uh, and has uh, significantly saved um, lives of people, uh, but also uh, reduce uh, blood that is wasted uh, due to uh, storage and transport uh, challenges. And so we've, we've been looking at innovative startups that can come and work with the government in respective sectors to tackle some of these challenges. And that's just one example, but we have many others in transportation, we have others in education and agriculture where we are looking at really solving some of these uh, fundamental challenges that we have. So something that I find very powerful about this conversation is the transformative and the fundamental transformative nature. Like, you know, if these partnerships can take place, uh, are able to solve uh, for our societies. But one question that's still, uh, um, you know, in my mind is, well, how the how do the two sides find each other? So I'm going to start with you, Eve, like as a government, yes, you know, you have your mandate and you'd like to solve some of these challenges. How do you find the right startups? Do you go looking out for them? Uh, do you know, you do you wait for them to come look for you? How does it work? Thank you. That's a very interesting question. Uh, in our context, it's been uh, really the government recognizing that um, uh, to achieve uh, the economic prosperity, we're going to have to actually handhold the process in which startups get to engage the government, uh, bring the solutions uh, that we need to, to solve uh, some of the, the challenges that we have. And so we understand that a startup has to have a strong value proposition vis-a-vis uh, -vis what we are trying to do as a government. And uh, we also have to have uh, uh, startups that are committed um, that understand the context of, of the, the, the government, uh, religious institutions that are probably procuring some of the solu these uh, solutions, and really understanding that um, 
uh, there are multiple ways of partnership with the government, but ultimately has to be uh, a forward-looking and, and, and long-term uh, kind of uh, commitment uh, to, to these solutions. Because as opposed to solutions that have probably track record that have been implemented in multiple contexts, usually we, we are engaging in startups that are just, uh, you know, you know, trying out their first use case. And so they have to be that um, core belief uh, and, 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 and partnership that is really looking uh, ahead uh, in the future. And so in our context, uh, obviously, we also have to create a con conducive environment, uh, whether through policy uh, and uh, regulatory framework. Uh, uh, we have uh, particularly a policy uh, geared toward uh, uh, public procurement for innovation. Um, I, I will talk more about this, but uh, essentially, we allow uh, startups to participate in public tendering process. Um, and um, previously, you know, the public procurement would privilege uh, use cases or companies that are, that are mature. And so we're creating an environment that, uh, from a um, uh, policy point of view, that, you know, allows startups to take a part of, of in this process. And of course, we also want to make sure that um, uh, we, as a um, particular ministry in charge of innovation, uh, we engage different uh, government agencies to uh, allow visibility of the progress that the entrepreneurs and the startup community is making. And to some extent, it's matchmaking approach. And so we do competitions uh, that are sector specific. We have a, a structure that allows uh, the ministry to be embedded in other sectors through uh, roles that we call chief digital officers. These are people that are really working hand in hand with other sectors, particularly from a digital uh, technology transformation, to make sure that we are uh, looking at the startup community and being able to, to, to work with them. So I think uh, while startups have to you know, present a strong value proposition, for us, we've also understood that um, we have to create you know, policies and, 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 and the procurement processes that uh, give a chance to uh, you know, uh, young new ideas that are that are trying to solve some of the challenges thank you so some great pointers there especially some of our viewers are from the public sector um and and, and we we will come back to those uh, but muhammad equally for startups who may be uh, watching this episode uh, or listening in they may be wondering yes it may be good uh, you know to to work with government but maybe if you if you don't mind telling your story how did how did you uh, start working with government and public sector for us, the start was through uh, consultancies and through some initiative that uh, some of the governments that we're looking for, and that take me, how do you actually have that first engagement? Because there is always the startup word itself in the government had a very, can have a very negative connotation. And there is a lack of understanding sometimes from a lot of governments. And, and I think we have to be... Um, we have also to distinguish between the forward-thinking governments, as we can see here with Eve and with, with Rwanda, but also in other places where there is still a lack of understanding the value that an entrepreneurship and the problem solving. And talking generally, because I, I know that Eve will miss all of the points I'm going to bring, because I think there's a lot that's been happening within Rwanda. But I will pick up, the first point I will pick up on is the exact point that mentioned about procurement. Today, if you look at the startups, you're looking at, we're building SaaS, you're going in and you're, you're looking at um, actually how can you have your monthly recurring revenue, how can you expand, you go to a government, a government want to procure for the next five years. They want to have an understanding how much it will cost us as a government to use the technology. That goes against everything that you are building as a startup. And also it goes into the core of your business model. And that's something that you have to understand how you deal with procurement. And we have these challenges at the beginning. Um, I remember we have, we have a tendering process with, and that even wasn't the government, a semi-government entity that they have a very strict tendering process where they have detailed itemized, I think about 30 items that you will have to break to the hardware, break into the operating system. Like you break down the cost 
item or item, we went in and we put one item there, which was that you're actually having a SaaS solution. And that get people extremely upset, extremely angry to an extent that we've been summoned in and we've been, we've been what we've been communicated to us is we don't respect the process. We do not respect the government. We do not respect the, which was in the case. But again, that is in our, in our early days. And when there was a complete uh, break there between how we are here to reduce costs, to bring in innovative modules of, uh, uh, and to help government even to reduce price. So we have to look at business models procurement, but also on the, on the other hand, there is the complete um, culture, the different culture between the startup and how we want to move things very quickly and you want to uh, build things and, and break while you're building. And uh, the other point is in the government is the complete opposite. I want to make sure that what I'm procuring today is going to serve our citizens and, and also serving everyone. Another big differentiator between government and, uh, and startups, as a startup, usually you have a well-defined group that you're targeting and you're working to, to provide services to that group. I don't have to provide my services to everyone, but... I have a very, uh, we, we, you, have, you have your customers that you are building your solutions towards and these are the ones that help you to growth. We recently been involved with one of the governments on, a, on, a, on an election program. We're doing election digitally, election on the phone, no polling stations. And one of the things that we have to address, everyone with that exception has to vote. If you are not, if you cannot go, there is no polling stations to go to. So you have to think of every single scenario. People who hasn't, people hasn't got phones. People who are, uh, I remember during one of the tests, during testing, people under 100. Uh, we had 105 that within the system was considered as underage, wasn't allowed to vote. So these small things that usually you wouldn't think of as a startup, but you have to think of. Another example within, within the election, one of the things that for us to do the verification, we do the process of lifeness detection and make sure the person in front of the goes through a number of checks. One of the checks is we need to make sure your eyes are open. We have blind people who wanted to vote. And that brings in, when, you, when we build our solutions as a startup, we want to build for I define it can be people between the age of 25 and 23. It can be a male or a female, for example, very targeted in a very niche market, very specific economical, uh, avail uh, economical affordability. That it's actually the complete opposite when you're dealing with government. You have to provide your services to everyone. And there are other points that we can touch upon later. Okay, so Mohammed, no, that, that's very interesting, and you know, it it may not be uh, all good stories everywhere, right? Like there are some challenges for startups and governments to work together. So, maybe how did you, uh, like, what would be your advice? How did you get around some of these procurement challenges and culture differences, um, in in your case, but also other startups that may be listening, maybe they are you know working or wanting to work with governments that may not have the public procurement policy as Eve is outlining that the Rwandan government has. So. What would be your recommendation? And I think number one is look at the government agencies that we're seeing more and more governments start to adopt a kind of a programs to incentivize a government, which can be accelerators, for example, linked directly or indirectly to the government. But what we found extremely effective is work with the, um, let's say, the well-established organizations. We built a very strong partnership network around very respected organizations that when, rather than us going directly to the government, we actually part of a wide, it can be part of a wider proposition. And, and then the usually 
that trusted partner, which can, which usually a trusted partner within the government or one of the major provider of technology or has access to the government, they will do the due diligence. They will also give the assurance to the, um, to the government that this is a viable solution. We stand behind it. And that helps in a lot of cases. It has its drawbacks or it has its, some, maybe it might have its limitation, but what we found, this is a very strong way to enable you to uh, to go into government uh, work with the government. And while you're doing that, you have to be extremely patient. And I think the most important thing and the most important advice for uh, startups, prepare for a very long winter when you're working when you're working with governments. You have to things goes in a much slower scale for a number of reasons. Bureaucracy, bureaucracy in government is not always a bad word, by the way. There, there is a reason for that bureaucracy. There is a reason that you have to get all of these approvals, all of these checks and balances, because sometimes it's people's, and, and again, the, the blood example in Rwanda, people's life are in stake. You cannot cut corners. We are used to cut corners, right? It is part of our nature to deliver as quickly as possible, but you cannot do this. For us, we the way that we prepared for that long winter, we do not we do not account for our government project part of our um, part of our growth numbers. For example, it is we we look at it like the black swans, and they do happen, and we are very lucky in number of opportunities and number of projects we work on, but they are there. But make sure that you have other income means or you have a product because we have our product that we are providing to the uh, enterprise and we're actively going in the government pace go, and try to go as fast as possible. But we understand these uh, gates that we are we are addressing and working around and working with. Okay, that's great. Thank you. So if one of the points that Mohammed mentioned, um, I'd like to take that up with you. So you have a startup that comes in with a very innovative solution. It, you know, something that you can foresee is going to benefit society as, you know, the representative from government. How do you collaborate and co-create with them? Because their solution, as Mohammed is saying, sometimes could be a very targeted niche solution for, you know, a, a particular group of people. How do you make that broad based for the rest of society and, you know, to tackle a sort of wider group? What is the role that you would recommend governments and public sector can play in that? Yeah. Thank you. And I think, Mohammed, you're right. Uh, you know, uh, typically the processes of procurement, um, we, we first, you know, how it typically works, we have to define what we need. We create terms of reference. We launch a tender and people express interest. And so the, uh, the alternative where, you know, as a startup, you come to the government, you pitch a solution. First of all, if it's not in my plan and I don't have a budget for it, you know, it's almost pointless to have that conversation because even yeah. if I like the solution, but I'm not looking for that solution, if, if that makes sense. And so uh, we've had to then be creative around how do we start introducing these new ideas and what are the kind of framework of... Um, of uh, uh, adopting these solutions into our processes. Because if it's simply relying on you've made a plan, uh, created uh, specifications, then you go out there to acquire a solution, the startups will never have a chance because the kind of requirements you have in place are prohibitive. And so for us, it's really investing upstream, you know, starting with rolling out incubation centers uh, because we didn't want to build the trust element. Usually the, the startups are providing solutions that again that you know fast client or, or fast customer uh and then the government usually would be risk averse especially when you're dealing with uh, uh public finances and so what we want to create within our ecosystem is a process where even when these innovators are coming up with solutions they are within our network of within our ecosystem and we can actually play an active role on guiding them on, on how the innovations, the uh, applications uh, can be, you know, uh, solving certain problems. And then from there we think about, okay, if it's not going to be a direct uh, procurement process, 
can we look at public uh, uh, private partnership where we have a long term engagement in how we roll out the solution? And can we look at also um, um, a model where uh, it's probably a commission based fee where the service is delivered? And maybe through such an agreement, there is a fee that is paid uh, as the service is delivered. And, and um, that has been actually instrumental in our journey for digitization because uh, not all the time government has to invest 100% in the, in the, in, to acquire the solution. We can actually you know, leverage the, the work that the innovator has already done uh, to say, okay, what if we enter into an agreement and then as um, we use the service, you, you get a fee. And in some cases, it's um, to eventually hand over uh, the solution to the government or to figure out also a different business model where we continue to engage. And so um, I think, again, what's important is to build a trust in terms of, you know, if Mohammed comes to government and is pitching a solution, how do I know that this is indeed um, a credible solution, a credible partner that is also looking long term? Uh, this is a solution that, that we can be able to uh, to utilize. And so we are mobilizing that understanding across different government agencies um, that you we don't always have to first mobilize the funding, define what we want to engage with innovators, but we can actually, you know, bring our challenges out to them and say, you know, how can we then implement a solution? Whether we acquire it, whether it's a, a PPP model that we set up or other business models that allow us to uh, bring the service to the citizen and, and ultimately for us um it, what's been helpful in our context is to accelerate um how fast can we you know solve the challenges how fast can we better uh, the services we're delivering to to the citizen and so uh, mohammed i think you're right when you say that some of these processes are designed uh to have accountability especially as yep. government as we are using public finance so we have to be accountable for uh, all the resources and so it's really building in different approaches and processes that, that allow us to be a partner to the startups to be able to achieve those goals. So very powerful points that the two of you are, are, are making. Um, you know, I find that really insightful. We're coming towards the end. So I'm going to uh, sort of try and end the conversation with asking your final pieces of advice. I'm going to start with you, Mohammed. So what I'd ask you, the two of you is, what would be your one advice for governments and one advice for startups um, in terms of how they can work together and maximize that collaborative sort of potential between the two? So, Mohammed, over to you. I'll start with the startup and uh, I will say something maybe I've said earlier, prepare for the long winter. <laughs> and um, just to elaborate on that, because, again, if if, you, if you're looking at some of the... Uh, changing your business model. And I think what you've said around number one, the PPP models, the collaboration, all of this again, be open-minded and be more understanding of the value that you will bring in. And uh, for government, the the change, the the world is being, if, if you look at technology built by startups and the the change, uh, a lot of the change we're seeing today is being built on garages. Be part of that and encourage that. We're seeing a lot of countries are encouraging startups and startups ecosystem. Um, currently, I was in an African country that they have a not uh, plus the ICT. They have small businesses and innovation, and it is fully focused on. Um, on the startups and the startup ecosystem and empowering the ecosystem. Uh, so I think for government is the, or the message I would say for government, the impact that these startups, uh, that they will bring in to the, um, uh, to the ecosystem, to the overall ecosystem, it cannot, cannot be, cannot be measured. Great. Thank you, Mohammed. So, thank Eve, you. your piece of advice. No, thank you. Uh, first of all, I w allow me to say that um, I don't think there is meant to be a one size fits all kind of approach to all governments or to all startups trying to solve even sometimes similar problems. Because 
Yeah, everyone is operating within their their own context, and so uh, something Mohammed mentioned: you have to be open-minded and adaptive to the, those constraints and 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 challenges. Now, both on the government and the startup, I think we need also to build um, an ecosystem that 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 allows everyone to do their part. And so there is what government can do from a policy approach, from a, a regulatory framework that 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 that, that is. Uh, uh, pushing innovators to 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 bring solutions, but also importantly, there are partners, both from private sector uh, development partners, that are really eager to support the, the job creation process. And so, uh, what has worked for us, especially when it comes to early stage uh, startups, is leveraging either it's technical support uh, or financial support at the early stage to push these startups forward. And to find use cases that really make sense. I think some problems may make sense for startups to engage with. Other things may not make sense depending on the complexity, uh, financial muscle, and, 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 and sophistication of the, uh, the solution that is needed. And so it's really even defining within the national strategies to say, what, what can we achieve by mobilizing uh, the youth, the young startups and companies uh, versus what we would need to go out for um, proven expertise. And so that balance has to be intentional. Uh, it cannot happen in a vacuum. And so really my encouragement to uh, to, to governments, and, and, and I think this is what we are learning in the process as well, and we also obviously learn from other uh, established ecosystem and, and, and prosperous uh uh, countries that have been able to do similar approaches. And, and, and again, my encouragement is to say uh, we have to be open-minded uh, even when we are in uh, public service, accountable to the citizen, and create pathways that allow our startups to, to, to succeed. And so I think, um, again, um, yeah, if, if we put uh, uh, the citizen at the, at the, at the, at the forefront, then startups also should be regarded as a part of uh, creating uh, socioeconomic prosperity uh, for, for our people. Thank you, Eve. I found this discussion powerful, uh, insightful, and really, really interesting. I, I really hope uh, to our viewers that you found this episode and our discussion interesting as well. And if you'd like uh, to join us for these kind of discussions, make sure to watch out uh, for our next episode. Make sure to subscribe so you get notified when the next episode is dropping. I'm going to end today by thanking our two guests, Mohammed and Eve. Thank you very much for joining and sharing your ideas and experiences with us. As part of our podcast series, Startups of Today for the Impact of Tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Copyright 2022 PWC. All rights reserved. PWC refers to the PWC network and or one or more of its member firms, each of which is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com forward slash structure for further details. This content is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.